Uh, Today we close out our four-week series called Change, Guilt, Pain, and Worry. Uh, Today we're going to be looking at the truth about worry. I have three older brothers, uh, older than me, 7, 10, and 12 years older, and my uh, oldest brother worries about his health. And recently he went to see the doctor, and the doctor said, you have nothing to worry about. You are going to live until you're 70. And my brother said, well, I'm 72. And uh, the doctor said, see, I told you. He, uh, he hates to fly, absolutely hates to fly. All three of my brothers hate to fly. But uh, he wants to visit family over the holidays, and so he bought an airline ticket online. And when he bought the ticket, he bought the flight insurance that goes with it in case the plane crashes. And then he went out for lunch and had some Chinese food, and the fortune cookie said, a recent investment will pay great dividends. <laughs> and so he canceled the flights. <laughs> Um, Anyway, there's a myth behind worry, and the myth behind worry is I can control things by worrying about them. If I worry about my kids, if I worry about my husband, about my wife, about my job, about my finances, about my health, if I worry about it, then I can control uh, the uncontrollable. Uh, That's why we worry. It's It's a control issue. But the truth is worry, uh, all it does is make you miserable. A worry accomplishes nothing. It's just stewing without doing. And so today I want us to look at, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus recognizes our tendency to worry, and he lays out for us uh, five reasons why we shouldn't worry. And then he gives us three antidotes to worry. And, uh, you know, as you read in the Bible, the, the most difficult command in the Bible is not don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. The most difficult command in the Bible is, it's in Philippians 4, 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Uh, That's a hard one. That's a hard one. But whenever God tells us to do something, God will tell us to do things we can't do. God will tell us to do things we can't do. But we can do them when we trust in him. He can do them through us, for us, in us. He'll make a way for us to do it. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus just gives us the truth about worry. So on your notes, on the screen, number one. First, worry is unreasonable. It's unreasonable, irrational. Worry does not make sense. Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? See, the problem is we tend to worry about material things. And and honestly, that's just irrational. We're worrying about the wrong things. Jesus says if if you're going to worry about something, make it something eternal, not external. If it's not going to last forever, don't worry about it. You know, I've seen people have coronaries because they spilled something on, on a dress or on their suit and if you dress like I do, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. But, but we'll get upset over the silliest things. And Jesus says, you can have gourmet food and designer clothes, but if you don't have peace of mind, you're missing the point. Now, to worry about something that you, you can't change is useless. To worry about something you can change is foolish. If you can change it, don't worry about it, change it. If you can't change it, it's foolish to worry about it top of that worry is unreasonable because it never solves the problem it just exaggerates the problem have you noticed that that when you worry the, the the problem doesn't get smaller the problem doesn't go away the problem gets bigger it gets bigger and bigger and bigger you know i mean the more you worry about it it doesn't solve it it just makes it worse so jesus says it's unreasonable to worry because it worry just blows the problem out of proportion Number two, worry is unnatural. It is unnatural to worry. It it, it goes against nature. And Jesus gives us a little lesson from nature here as, as he shows us that worry is unnatural. In verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And... Why worry about your clothes? Look at the field lilies. They don't worry about theirs. 
Yet King Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautifully as they. And so he starts out, he, talk, he talks about birds. And, and I'm not a bird watcher. I'm, I'm not an ornithologist. I mean, it seems to me that birds don't do all that much it, except build a nest once a year and then flutter around looking for cars that have just come out of the car wash. <laughs> and, you know, they twitter and tweet and they're pretty and, and they eat a lot of bugs, but they don't seem to do a whole lot. Yet God says, I take care of the birds. Aren't you a lot more valuable than birds? And then Jesus moves from birds to botany. He, he says, look at the flowers. Have you ever looked at a flower up close? I, I love to look at flowers, look at the intricate details of, of flowers and plants. I mean, you look at, at, at the God, how much energy and time and he put into the, just these exquisite flowers that have a lifespan of about six weeks. And Jesus says, God clothes the lilies of the field and he takes care of them. They don't worry. Animals don't worry. Plants don't worry. In fact, the only thing that God created that worries is people. All the rest of creation just simply trusts God. But people, uh, we worry. And it's unnatural. You know, some people say, well, I'm just a natural-born worrier. No, you're not. It's a learned behavior. We learn to worry. We learn it from our parents. We learn it from our peers. We learn it from other people. It's a learned response. And since worry is a learned response, the good news is it can be unlearned. You don't have to be a worry wart. You don't have to let anxiety mess with your life. You, you, you had to learn how to worry. You practiced it a lot. Some of us have practiced it to where we're really good at it. But we can unlearn it because it's unnatural. Our, our bodies were not made for worry. And you can see that because of what it does to us. We get all kinds of headaches and, and ulcers and illnesses and, and, and it affects our heart. I mean, you ever heard somebody say, I am worried sick? And it's true. When you worry, it makes you sick. Uh, a couple of Proverbs you can write down. Proverbs twelve twenty five. An anxious heart weighs a man down. An anxious heart, a worried heart weighs a man down. Proverbs fourteen thirty. A heart at peace gives life to the body. See the difference? Anxiety, worry, it weighs you down. When you don't worry, when you're at peace, it brings life to the body. You know, worry causes more fatigue than work. Probably because more people worry than work. But it's, it's just unnatural. It's unreasonable. Uh, Jesus says your, your father knows your need. God cares for you as a heavenly father. Children get special treatment. Third thing, Jesus says, is worry is unhelpful. It's unhelpful. It doesn't, doesn't help us. doesn't do anything for us. At verse 27, he says, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Worry can't make your life a day longer. can't make it an hour longer. In fact, if anything, worry shortens your life. It just doesn't work. And when you worry about your past, d does it change it? No. When you worry about your future, does it control it? No. All worry, worry doesn't change the past. It doesn't control the future. All it does is just rob you of today. It, it just messes up today. That's all it does. It's the most worthless energy that you can expend because it does nothing except make you miserable. It's unhelpful. It doesn't work. Number four. Jesus says that worry is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. We don't, we don't have to do it. We, 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 get to the, we get to the meat of this in verse 30. He says, And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he more surely care for you? O oh, you of little faith. He says there's no need to worry because God has promised to take care of you. It's your heavenly Father. It's what he does. It's what he does. And, you know, God, God can take care of you. God needs to be your source of supply, not some other person, not some project, not, not, not some piece of property. Not, you know, it, God is the source of supply. And if God turns off the faucet here, he can turn another faucet on over here. If God closes this door, he can open that door. He can open a window. God can make a way uh, to provide. He says, don't worry, I'll take care of you. Because the bottom line is, worry is not trusting God. O ye of little faith. 
It's not trusting God. Uh, worry indicates that you misunderstand what God is like. If I misunderstand what God is like, I'm not going to trust him. And if I can't trust him, then I'm going to worry. And so the issue isn't, are you worried? The issue is, who do you think God is? Do you think God will do what he says he'll do? Because we always get in trouble when we doubt God's character. We always get in trouble when we doubt God's love, when we doubt his word, the promises that he's made to us. I mean, if God can be trusted with my salvation, he can be trusted with everything else. You know, we say, oh God, I'm, I'm trusting you to forgive all my sins, to wipe away my guilt. I'm, I'm forgiving you to save me from eternal damnation in hell. I'm trusting you to give me eternal life in heaven. I'm trusting you with my very soul. But God, I'll take care of my finances. I'll take care of my health. I mean, that's just ludicrous. God saved you. He solved your biggest problem. Any other problem you have is minor by comparison. It's like you're, you're hitchhiking. You're out walking on a dirt road somewhere. You've got a big backpack with all your stuff in the back of it. And a farmer pulls up in a pickup and offers you a ride. And so you open the door, you start to climb in, and the, and the farmer says, hey, throw your backpack in the back of the truck. And you say, no, 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 no. It's enough that you would carry me. I'll carry the backpack. See how ludicrous that is? It's like getting on an airplane and never putting your full weight down. Okay? It's ludicrous. You know, no, I, I, I got I to do, do my part. And yet we say that to God all the time. We say, God, well, you know, you, you can take care of the big things, but I'll handle the family. I'll handle the money. I'll handle the job issues. And God's like, what are you talking about? I mean, I can take care of it. I supply all your needs, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, relational, financial. And if you think God can't take care of those things, or if you think God won't take care of those things, or if you think God won't do it the way you want him to, then it boils down to a lack of faith. It boils down to, really, number five, which is worry is unchristian. Worry is unchristian. When you worry, you act like an unbeliever. You act as if God doesn't exist. You act as if God isn't who he says he is. It's unchristian. Now, non-believers, non-believers have a right to worry. In fact, they ought to be worried. I mean, if I didn't have a personal relationship with God through my faith in Christ, I'd be worried. I mean, I mean all you've got to do is pick up a newspaper, turn on the TV or radio, you know, look, log on to Facebook. I mean, there's a lot of things to worry about. I mean, if, if I were not a believer, if I didn't have Christ in my life, if I didn't recognize that God was my Heavenly Father, I'd have every reason to worry. Because I think, I've I got to take care of this on my own. But Christians are different. We, we don't have to worry because we have a Heavenly Father who says, I'll supply all your needs. I care for the birds, I care for the flowers, I'll take care of you. And God says, you are my children, and yet you act like orphans every time you worry. You, you're saying, I don't think God will do what he promised he'll do. I, I don't trust God to, to do what he says he'll do. Now, that, that's what you're saying when you worry. Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows you need them. I mean, yet how often do we act like God doesn't know about the house payment? Or we act like God is unaware of our health? I mean, if you don't believe that God will help me out of this mess, then I've got to take matters into my own hands. I, I start thinking it all depends on me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. But no, for, for the believer, worry is, is playing God. Worry is when you assume responsibility for something that God never intended for you to be responsible for. You're trying to control the uncontrollable. And most of your life is beyond your control. Most of your life is beyond your control. I mean, you, know, you have a choice over how you react and how you respond to a lot of things in life, but you don't control everything around you. But God says, don't worry. Because it's unchristian. You're playing God. You're, you're, it's a poor testimony for a Christian to worry. You're saying, I, I don't have a Heavenly Father who cares for me. I've got to take care of myself. You're living like a street kid. Now, we're in a moment, we're going to look at the antidote uh, to worry. But before that, I, I want you to stop right now, and I want you to write down uh, on your outline somewhere, just write down your greatest worry. And, and if the person next to you is your greatest worry, just draw a little arrow. <laughs> Don't 
Don't write their name down. Just a little arrow, maybe a little finger pointing over. Okay? But I want, I, I want you to identify it because I, I don't want you to miss the blessings out, out of, out of this, this next point. Uh, you know, uh, about six months ago, I went into the hospital and, and had heart surgery. And <clears throat> I actually went into the hospital on Monday, but they weren't going to do the surgery until Wednesday morning. And so that meant I had two, two days and two nights in the hospital before I had the surgery. And Tuesday night, the night before the surgery, my, my nurse, Maria, came in. I love nurses and doctors. I just want to go on record. I love nurses and doctors. They take such good care of you. And I love the people over there. And this Maria, bless her heart, sweetest person on the planet. But she walked in the room and she looked at me in the bed and, and then just turned around and walked out. And about 45 minutes later, she comes back in, she looks at me and then turns around and walks out. About an hour later, she comes back in the room, walks in, looks at me and then turns around and walks back out. And about the fourth time she did it, about 10 o'clock at night, she comes in and then she stands there and she looks at me and she goes... So what do you do? I said, what? And she goes, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. She goes, that explains it. (laughs) And I'm, explains what? And she goes, well, typically, the night before surgery, we have to give people uh, anxiety medication. Something, because they're worried, they're upset, concerned about the surgery, and we have to give them something to calm them down so they can sleep. She goes, "You, you don't need anything. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, As as you know, after the surgery, they messed up my vocal cords, and I went to the uh, ear, nose, and throat guy. He runs a scope down my, up through my, I don't know what these things are called, espahagus or something, anyway. And um, looks looks in there, and then he says to me, he goes, what do you do? And I said, well, uh, I'm a pastor. And he went, real poker face. And uh, he said, I, I don't know if this is going to get any better. I, I, don't, I don't know if you're going to be able to talk. And I, I just told him, I said, you know, God's got this. And if I have to spend the rest of my life as a greeter at Walmart, <laughs> I mean, you know, whatever it is. But worrying about it isn't going to change it. It's beyond my control. And, and it, it's, it's just an offense to God to worry about it. God, you got it. Take it. So I, I want us to look at the antidote, antidote to worry. Now, I, I asked my daughter, I said, if I tell those two stories, am I sounding too pious? Do I need to tell them a story about where I worry? Because I do, I do worry about things. And she said, no, they already know how to do that. <laughs> okay. So she said, just encourage them. So, okay, so there you go. <clears throat> but the antidote to worry, number one, you've got to put God first in every area of my life. Put God first in every area of my life. Give him first place. A powerful verse, Matthew 6, 32. Your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need. And he will give them to you if, circle the word if, you give him first place in your life and live as he wants you to. If you trust and obey, God will give you what he perfectly knows you need. I mean, you know, worry is just a warning light that, that something's out of whack, that, that your life is out of order, that your priorities are, are misplaced. When I start worrying, it means something else has taken first place in my life. And any area of your life where God is not number one is going to become a source of worry for you. And it might be a relationship, it might be your job, your finances, your health, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever area of your life God does not have first place, and that's going to be a source of worry for you. Because nothing was meant to take the place of God. The commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. And so you've got to get your priorities right. And when you do, it just simplifies life, and it, it takes the worry out of it. You just do what God tells you to do and let him take care of the rest. And the starting point is to commit your life to Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, I'd encourage you right now in this moment to just say, Jesus, I give you my life. 
I give, you, I give you the things I worry about, the things I don't worry about. I give you my past, my present, my future, my relationships, my money, my, my family, my job, the whole bit. God, I want you to be number one in every area of my life. Because if you put God in number one, everything else will fall into place. But if we love anything more than we love God, that's going to become a source of worry. You know, it, it, you, you put your work ahead of God, you're going to worry about your work. You put your kids ahead of God, you're going to worry about your kids. You put your health ahead of God, you're going to worry about your health. You put money ahead of God, you're going to, you're going to worry about your money. You know, if you don't want to worry, just put God first in that area. Number two, second antidote. is you Live just one day at a time. You live just one day at a time. You know, you, you don't open your umbrella until it starts raining. You, know, you don't worry about tomorrow. You just focus on today. Jesus said, so don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow will have its own worries. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So there are two days you should never worry about. Yesterday and tomorrow. Because yesterday, worry can't change it. Tomorrow, worry can't control it. If you worry about tomorrow, you're just borrowing trouble from a day that's not even here yet. And, and what happens is, is you miss out on the blessing of today. You're wasting it on yesterday. You're wasting it on tomorrow. God only gives us enough grace for one day at a time. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. God has created the universe. He has wired us up that we live life in 24-hour increments. We don't live it all at once. It'd be too much to bear. We don't even live it a week at a time. Just one day at a time. You know, that's just that's the way God doles out his grace. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on today. Now, notice he says, don't worry about tomorrow. He doesn't say, don't plan, don't prepare. Because the Bible has lots to say about planning and preparing. But there's a difference between planning and preparing and worrying. And you've got to understand the difference between those two. And really, you need to focus on today. Uh, elsewhere in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, he said, taught us to pray. Give us this day our monthly bread. No, no. Give us this day a weekly supply of bread. God, I want to see enough bread for the next seven days. I want to be able to line it out here and just stack it up. No. It says, give us this day our daily bread. I mean, that, that's how it's supposed to come to us. And I don't know about you, but the way I, I get my daily bread is I get it in, in increments throughout the day. I don't get up in the morning and eat all the food designated for that day for breakfast. I, no, I eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, a little snack before I go to bed. I, you know, it's, it's spread out. Okay, I have a snack in the afternoon too, Okay. <laughs> Little cinnamon popcorn never killed anybody. So, you know, but you, you spread it out, out through the day. That's how God provides for us. Uh, before I come out here and preach, every service uh, back here, I just spend time in prayer, and one of the things I do is I just pray through the, the Lord's Prayer, just focusing a phrase at a time, just, just getting all the goody out of them I can. And one I really focus on before I come out here is give us this day our daily bread. And, and when I focus on that one, what I'm praying is, is, God, just give me enough strength for this next message. Give me just a, enough uh, energy, enough grace, enough clarity of thought and speech, enough anointing, enough uh, you know, outpouring of the Spirit to just get me through this message. God, just get me through this one, and I'll see you in about another 30, 40 minutes asking for another dose, okay? But all I'm asking for is just, is just the next one. And honestly, that concept of daily provision... Trusting God to meet me where I am today in this moment is a crucial part of walking in the Spirit. It's walking in the Spirit rather than trusting in my own flesh. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow's not here yet. This is today. God, meet me right here, right now. Help me with this. And then I don't have to worry about it. Number three, trust God to care for things beyond your control. Care for the things that are beyond my control. And, and that's the heart of the matter in verse 30 where Jesus says, you of little faith. Because worry and trust, worry and faith can't live in the same heart at the same time. You, you can't hold 
thoughts of worry and thoughts of faith in your brain at the same time. Because when you invite worry in the front door, faith goes out the back door. And when you invite faith in the front door, worry goes out the back door. Because worry and faith, they, they can't tolerate each other. They can't operate together at the same time. And so you've got to decide, am I going to worry or am I going to trust? And, and which thought am I going to hold? And there are things that are beyond your control. But, but with those things, you trust God because they're not beyond his control. They're not. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. There's the tension between worry and faith. Tell God your needs. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. Don't worry, pray. Don't panic, pray. You know, if it isn't worth praying about, it's not worth worrying about. And if it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. Romans 8:32. Uh, since God didn't spare even his own son for us. Circle the phrase, for us. This is for us. But gave him up for us. Won't he surely give us everything else? I mean, if God loved me enough to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for me, don't you think he loves me enough to care for every other need that I've got? Because that's why he did it. That's why he sent Christ to meet my needs. That's why he invites me to trust Christ to meet my needs. That's why he invites me to live for Christ, put Christ first to meet my needs. Let's bow together. God, there there, there are just lots of opportunities for worry represented here this morning. And I don't have any idea what they are, but God, you know every one of them. You've seen them, you know them, you've cataloged them. You've seen the crisis in the souls of the people who are here today. And God, I just thank you that we don't have to worry. That you have promised to care for our needs when we put you first in our life and when we just do what you say. And so God, today, I I, I just want to take these steps again personally. I want you to have first place in every area of my life. And I want to live one day at a time, trusting you one moment at a time. And I want to trust you for the things that are beyond my control. And now I, just, I invite all of you to ju- just talk to God about, about your worry. Whatever you wrote down, whatever's weighing on your heart, just say, God, you, you know what I'm worried about. And part of my worry is I don't know how to handle it. In fact, I, I know I can't handle it. But God, you can. And so use this worry to draw me closer to you. And God, I just want to put Jesus Christ in first place in my life in every area I want to live, live one day at a time, and I want to trust you for the things that are beyond my control. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.